Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. This episode of Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Alex is a brand new graphic novel coming out from Marvel and Abrams Books. Fantastic Four, Full Circle. It comes out September 6th. It's a rainy night in Manhattan, and not a creature is stirring except for the thing, Ben Grimm. When an intruder suddenly appears inside the Baxter building, the Fantastic Four find themselves surrounded by a swarm of invading parasites. These carrion creatures, composed of negative energy, come to Earth using a human host as a delivery system. But for what purpose? And who is behind this untimely invasion? The Fantastic Four have no choice but to journey to the Negative Zone, an alien universe comprised entirely of antimatter, risking not just their own lives, but the fate of the cosmos. Fantastic Four Full Circle is the first long-form work written and illustrated by acclaimed artist Alex Ross, who revisits a classic Lee Kirby story from the 60s and introduces the storyline for a new generation of readers. Bold, vivid colors, his trademark visual storytelling, Ross takes Marvel's first team of superheroes to places only he can illustrate. The book also features a special poster jacket with the front flap unfolding to reveal an all-new fully painted origin story of the Fantastic Four. Again, Fantastic Four, full circle, out September 6th. For more details, go to alexrossart.com. All right, quiet on the set. Camera speed. Sound production, take one. Action. What, we have a new intro. Yeah, I like that intro. I it was good. I, I liked it. All right, good deal. I I know, and that's well. Maybe as we do these movie review uh, episodes, that might be the new uh, intro for those. But welcome everybody. It's uh, time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. I'm here with the Kinescope crew of Gabe Hardman and Ian Brill, and uh, we're really excited to talk. Unfortunately, uh, we lost Henry Silva last week. Good run, ninety four, ninety five, something like 95, that. Ninety five, ninety five, I believe. Uh, we're not excited that he died, but no. we're excited to talk about his career. What a career. My yeah. God. I, those One of these great actors that had over 100 film credits, like 140 mm -hmm. uh, character credits, and then several where he played himself in documentaries and even a fun movie from the 80s that I wanted to briefly touch on as well. But uh, yeah, what a career, man. Yeah. And, you know, he's one of those guys that you know, he, he has that weird career where, you know, he was somebody who lived into this modern age, but he had, you know, he was still at a time where people would play, you know, people who had sort of, you know, ethnicities that were, you know, that, that people thought were not so clear would, would end up playing all sorts of ethnicities that doesn't yeah. doesn't come off so great these days, but like, you know, but in reality, he was, you know, part Sicilian, part Spanish, you know, he grew up in Brooklyn or he was born and grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, and, uh, and he's actually, I didn't, I didn't realize this, but he was an actor studio guy, like, uh, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. not something you would associate with him because he's so known for playing these kind of very, you know, all the bad guy roles, but you know, not, he's not a flamboyant actor really, you know? No, but like a uh, Christopher Walken had a very distinct way of speaking and, and his presence, I think. I don't know oh, why. Yeah, but, definitely. You know what I, mean, I mean, no, I think that that's what his look and his intensity and the kind of odd way that you know, or unconventional way that he would, um, you know, read the line, approach the lines, approach the work. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. is, uh, you know, was it's why you remember him, and he's just such a distinctive guy. He and he pops up everywhere, and you know, and it's you know, he is one of those. It's that guy sort of guys. And he worked with so many great filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, first time I saw, I have a distinct memory of when I first, the first time he he made an impression on me. Uh, it was actually funny enough one of his last roles. Uh, I saw Ghost Dog, the Jim Jarmusch movie where uh, Forrest Whitaker is this vigilante uh, ninja. Uh, he plays a um, a mafia uh, boss, uh, mm -hmm. one of the many type roles he he play, and I remember. Seeing that face, seeing those those high cheekbones and those steely eyes, and being like, "Who is that?" He looks like a Frank Robbins drawing. Yeah, uh, no, so good. Uh, like, who who is that? 
and strangely, later on, um, a few years later, I'd watch uh, the Manchurian Candidate, the uh, the original one with Frank Sinatra, and he shows up there uh, in a small but memorable role. And we'll here's a film. It. 30 years before ghost dog or more than 30 years before ghost dog and that face you see that face again and you're like oh i remember that face yeah and i was absolutely. just like he's a guy i looked out for i don't uh, remember exactly the first place i saw him although he, he i i actually kind of love ghost dog the jim jarmusch movie and yeah it's a good, uh, good movie it's, uh it, it's I, I think it's gotten better over the years also it i mean it has that amazing soundtrack by the rizzo that's like yep. one of my favorite yep. things but uh, the but yeah no he has a great little moment in that along with a bunch of other you know I mean there's there's other great kind of gangster associated character actors in that movie too yeah but uh, but like uh, just John what do you remember your first uh, Henry Silva uh, memory I'm because assuming, I, I don't really I'm assuming it was either Ocean's Eleven or uh, perhaps believe it or not and I, I I did want to acknowledge this film of all things uh, ironically Cinderella. Where oh, he yeah, played right. because I know I saw Cinderella as a very small kid, and he was one of the uh rude stepbrothers to uh Jerry and stuff. And there, and even that scene is like kind of a wacky behind in uh mm -hmm. scene where uh he's trying to light a cigarette for Silva and he crushes it, and that's why Silva's giving him the stink eye right. in this moment and everything. So let's see if we got a comment. Ah, Don Lenza says, of course, Manchurian is his favorite, and I respect that absolutely. Um, yeah, we'll get into it, man. But we, do we want to start at the beginning as far yeah, as... Yeah, I, I mean, I do. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the actor studio thing because it's, uh, it's you know, it's his entree into everything, really, because he was part of uh, um, uh, a little, like, I guess an improv scene that was then developed into, like, a little one act or something that became this play called Hatful of Rain that, uh, that's a sort of, you know, uh, it was later made into a movie without any of the people that were in the stage version, I think. Uh, or, although maybe he was in that as well. Actually. I believe he I was in that. Yeah. I was. Yeah. I, I didn't grab a, a a visual of it, right. but I believe he is in. It. Yes, he is. In yeah, it. he is. In that. That's right. It's just the two leads who are not in it. Uh, Nineteen fifty-seven. Yeah, because the the stage version leads were Ben Gazar and Shelley Winters, and uh, they were you know actor studio people as well. And uh, you know, so him, you know, when it was taken to Broadway, this was uh, th this was kind of his big break. The, uh, the one of the weird connections is that uh, Hatful of Rain was written by, you know, another actor studio guy, uh, you know, Michael Gazzo, uh, the uh, who he later, uh, well, no, you know him from Godfather 2. And uh, and then uh, later they're both in Alligator. So uh, but but we'll get to that. Oh, we'll get to Alligator. <laughs> I, lo I love that movie. <laughs> oh, yeah, I will get to it. Okay. I watched it. I watched it. <laughs> oh my and, god! And John watched an almost horror movie. It's it's the, well, you is, know you really and, prepared and for it. That's movie. that's the kind of horror movie that I'm okay with. Yeah, because it really you know, and we'll get we'll it's talk a about that a little bit off that movie. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. absolutely. In the city, but but very early in his career, and actually, Ian is the one who watched it. Uh, I guess he was on an Alfred Hitchcock presents back in 1956. Yes, uh, called uh, I believe it's called a uh, better bargain. Um, is an episode where he plays an assassin. Uh, it may be the first time he plays an assassin. It would not be the last. Uh, one notice notable thing is that uh, the character is called Harry Silver, which is weird because his name is Henry <laughs> Silva. I don't know if that's why he got the part. Um, it does um, the the part he's he's he is good uh, and he it shows something that I think would um, be a bit of a trademark in the fact that so he's playing a bad guy he often would uh, he's playing a bad guy who is uh, confident in himself so confident that he doesn't have to be demonstrative uh, he doesn't have to raise his voice he could just be uh, uh, just steely-eyed and uh focused and in in the result is he becomes much uh scarier and much more effective like that than he would be as a as a maybe more of a a heavier heavy uh and he silva grew up in spanish harlem he talks about he grew up in a tough neighborhood in a tough time and uh pretty much the depression era uh i i think he grew up around real gangsters and he knew how those guys were and he knew that the scariest guys were not 
the guys who made the most noise, the scariest guys were the quiet guys. And I think he brought that and, and he brought, and a, brought a that to every yeah. brought that to every single role he ever did for the rest of his life. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't grab a uh, a picture of his co-star in that Hitchcock episode, but it's Robert Middleton. And yeah. he's another great character actor that you've seen in a million movies, big heavy set balding guy. Yeah. Um, and, and a great character actor, so it's kind of cool. I was wondering, uh, I guess, I was wondering if Norman Lloyd had directed that episode. He did not. No. But uh, but again, it's uh, no, it's uh, very distinctive. And again, one of the one of the great shows of the of the fifties. And then, of course, we go into uh, you know uh, one of oh, one of his big westerns. No, well, hold on, please. I want I want to talk about something. Go for it. Of, it's controversial on this show. Uh, I want to talk about the tall tea. Um, the oh, yeah. uh, Bud Bedecker movie, uh, it's uh, it's actually one, it literally one of my favorite movies. The um, and I I think that and his character in it, uh, he plays uh, this is one of those uh, he's cast ethnically sort of roles, uh, you know, and the uh, even though it's a little bit hard to tell within the actual movie, but uh, he but his his name is uh, pretty offensive, so I'm not going to say it. Well, but, but we will say that this is the first time that he was cast. As an Asian, I don't yeah, mind saying right. that it was No, no, uh, of course. I'm hundred percent what we got to talk about throughout the show. It's just that um, the I'm I'm actually saying that it's not particularly clear within the movie, even though. No. So, no. Um, but uh, but it is he. You know, he plays one of the kind of uh, younger, dumber thugs, and uh, you know, and like so much of what's great about the movie is uh, is the the way the uh, the villain and Randolph Scott interact with each other, and uh, and kind of can sort of see each other as equals in a way that is way more sophisticated than some white hat, black hat sort of thing, and uh, and like he's his character is sort of crucial for. Uh, you know, he plays a kind of psychopath character, of course, but it's uh, but it's it's cru his his actions are crucial in the dynamics of the way the rest of the movie work. I think it's a and great Richard, movie, and I just highly recommend. It. Absolutely, Richard Boone is the is yeah, the Richard you Boone. know is the principal villain in that, and of course later became Paladin. Right, and, and I I, I, got, I gotta say, I just love how rich. I mean. You know, uh, Randolph Scott is a stiff, but like, uh, you know, but I mean, he's in some great movies, but he is yeah. sort of stiff. But the, uh, but Randolph like, Scott. <laughs> uh, you know, um, Richard Boone has a kind of like he's there's something, you know, a little slime, you know, slimy about him all the time on, on camera. But he's also he just projects being smart in a way that yes. uh, that I love. And um, uh, and, and it's just super interesting. Well, and it's it's one of the great adult westerns yes. of its era, and 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 Bedecker, of course, was a genius. Yeah, and even beyond his films that are so great, uh, a handful of the very early Maverick episodes with James Garner were directed mm -hmm. by Bud Bedecker as well. Yeah, I mean, he did go into TV after that. I mean, he's he's really known now for those, um, you know, uh, the. Bat Jack uh, Westerns, the uh, produced by John Wayne's company, that, you know, uh, that that all starred Randolph Scott and were, you know, uh, uh, Comanche Station and uh, uh, Seven Men. Seven Men from Now was the first one. It wasn't a Bat Jack. I don't think, but well, wait, you know, anyway. And then on the on the heels of the Tall T, he with Gregory Peck did the Bravados, mm -hmm. which is another great western of its era. And by the way, quick side note: I always forget how many big movies Joan Collins made. Mm. Uh, and really did work with a lot of the greats, both directors and uh, and and uh, and stars. And I mean, yeah, obviously Gregory Peck, Stephen Boyd from uh, the Oscar and and other right. other and Fantastic Voyage and things. But here's uh, here's a great still, and there you see uh, Silva at the uh, far right in in jail, and there's Gregory Peck, of course, you know, looking down at the convicts. Yeah. Uh, one thing I got to say about the movie is that, like, I, I believe the screenplay is credited to Philip Jordan, and he's one of those guys who is a uh, um, he's he's one of those notorious. I believe. Don't sue me if I'm wrong about this, but I think I believe he's one of those kind of notorious hack writers from the old days who would hire other people to do his scripts and just crank shit out as, as crank as much shit out as possible. And so some of the movies that he's credited with end up being these ridiculous things that uh, that are kind of worth it for how like bizarre they ended up being. Well, isn't Henry King the director of the infamous King Brothers? Uh, who made all these like short, you know, fast mm -hmm. kind of exploitive movies and stuff, and and they are featured in 
Um, they're played by Stephen Boyd and John Goodman in um, the movie about Dalton Trumbo, uh, the Trumbo movie. Oh, you mean um, Trumbo? You know, yeah, Trumbo. Yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, no, and that's what I was going to say. Like Henry yeah. King was one yeah, of those yeah, guys, right, so, yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So kind of interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and again, then uh, you know we 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 move on. And I, and I, and also, I don't remember his character from Bravados, but um, uh, Ricardo Montalban, Hector Elizondo are other character ex actor examples that would just be cast in a very generic ethnic way. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, from a comedy standpoint, Bernie Capel from The Love Boat and Get Smart, uh, one of his first roles was in, was a Hispanic role. And he would just get typecasted as as Hispanics, and and again as we move uh, through um, Silva's career, we'll see other times that he's cast as Asians or other ethnicities. So you know, it is he what it might, is. That was the he reality of the hold, way it worked back then. Yeah, he might hold the record for most ethnicities portrayed. I th I, I don't know how you could gauge possible. that. Yeah, but if I had to take a guess, him, Peter Sellers, uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Boris Karloff. Well, yeah, it, it's between the three of them. And again, I, I, uh, you know, I mean, look at his eyes. They could be several. I mean, you could see him as a Native American. You could see him as a Spaniard. You could see him. I, I think it's, you know, it's not to get too into the weeds with this, but I also think it's a little the shape of his face, and that he's just kind of ambiguously, you know, like you can't really tell what he's doing. I'm hip. I'm hip. Absolutely. Um, so was Ocean's Eleven next? I think that's correct. Is that, um, is that 61 or 62? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going I'm, I'm to go back and look at that because actually I'm not sure about that. Um, Hold on. Got to find I thought it. That, yeah, I thought that was. I thought I had the list uh, up, but then I was grabbing more uh, last minute photos of Henry. Um, But it certainly was near that early part. And also, by the way, during that time, he was doing a lot of television and, mm -hmm. and again, did a lot of Westerns uh, before, you know, uh, you know, finding himself in other roles. As I scroll down, I'm on his uh, IMDb page right now. Um, it's Cinderella was before. Was it before Ocean's Eleven? Ocean's Eleven is sixty. So yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, both were yes. Actually, Ocean's Eleven is listed before Cinderella. So yes, here once again, the group, the original Ocean's Eleven, Akeem mm. Tamaroff, right there, dead center with. <laughs> Peter Lawford and the Nick most Lawford. important guy in in the shot, Akeem Tamaroff. Well, I, I'm always, again, that's another one of those great character actors. I love Everybody. him. No, he's the most important to me. I'm not even joking. <laughs> I don't disagree. But no, look, I mean, truly, all these guys: Norman Fell, Henry Silva, uh, Richard Conti, Buddy Lester, Joey Bishop, of course, Sammy. There's Frank Dean, Peter Lawford, Akeem Tamaroff. I forget this guy. I'll be honest, and I forget uh, the cowboy. I don't remember those guys. What? But uh, okay. great stuff, man! Great, great I will, stuff. Not, not to be morbid, but just to acknowledge, I believe he was the last living member of the yeah. Ocean's yeah. Eleven. Well, yeah. is it? Well, Angie's still. Well, yes, of the Eleven crew. Not, yeah, but, but she's I mean, the last. Well, yeah, of of the, she's the last star that still, I think, right. surviving yeah, she's as far as the film. Of the so, men yeah. in the cast who are the only important people, right? Right, right, right. The Eleven. I'm yeah. happy. I don't know. No, that's fair. No matter um, what ethnicity they play. Yeah, exactly. I still, <laughs> I still, I still love that movie. I still love that movie. Um, you know, he he really introduces Richard Conte's important uh, character in the movie yeah. as well. He's the one who meets him when he's uh, just out of uh, college, as uh, the gangsters say about being in prison. I feel like that that movie for me is like I don't I don't love it in that like I just find it kind of slow and kind of you know creaky but the, but like I uh i do think it's one of those movies that has such an awesome last shot that it, oh kinda, yeah uh that it that it makes you feel like you liked the movie more than you actually did like you know i don't know well it's it's an incredibly misogynistic movie uh it is of its time yeah i, I was i, I don't even remember it that much i just remember it, it being kind of slow or creepy. well and i mean really in a lot of ways the 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 remake uh follows the basic plot it's this mm -hmm. crew of heist yeah, people sure, sure. that uh but in the case of the original they were commandos during world war ii and um and sinatra you know puts mm -hmm. them together to to make this heist and i love it because it is 1960 uh, oh, las yeah. vegas 
And also, um, it was a New Year's tradition on on Chicago television before before VCRs and stuff. Yeah. We would get it every year at New Year's and stuff. And in fact, I do believe they still play it around New Year's because well, it's, it's a New Year's movie. It definitely fits into that category of like a movie that all of the stuff in it, all you know, the the stuff they're wearing, the Las Vegas of it, that world is so cool that it feels like there's, you know, like like yeah. I, I'm I'm on board for just like the ambiance of the movie. There's a lot of movies like that. I mean, like there's this this movie called Model Shop that I think is garbage from uh, by uh, um, you know. You know, it's a no. It's it Jacques Demi, Jacques Demi, and yeah. like, oh, okay, uh, yes, and like, yes. it's set in Los Angeles. Yes, the only it's, American movie he made, I believe. Yes. I think it is. Yeah, yeah. I think it yes. is. Yes, but it's it's just one of those that's been going around a little bit lately, getting screenings, and just like it's the movie is nothing but like just seeing shit in Los Angeles from 1967 yeah. or whatever. It's awesome have, enough just to go for it, you know, go with the movie. Absolutely, no question. Um, and by the way, real fast, that last moment about Ocean's Eleven. Uh, that is where uh, Dean Martin sings "Ain't That a Kick in the Head," mm. and and it's funny because that never became a hit until years later. They mm. did release it as a single; it bombed, and then people really rediscovered it on, and they threw it on as a lark, a Sinatra greatest hits thing, probably because of this movie. And now everyone has rediscovered it, and it is one of the great Dean mm. Martin songs, in my opinion. Interesting. So, yeah. and then Cinderella, Flynn. So, uh, again, and, you know, I love the story about Cinderella that um, uh, Lewis wanted that to be a Christmas movie. And Paramount was really pushing for him to put it out in the summer because it was done. And this was the beginning of uh, 1960. And uh, he's like, listen, I'm going to be down in Miami. I'm going to be at the Fountain Blue. I'm going to come up with a different movie for you for the summer. Leave Cinderella for Christmas. And he made uh, The Bellboy. Oh, right. Yeah. And, and the bellboy is, whether you like it or not, it's one of those classic Jerry Lewis movies. Is, is the bellboy the one with the gigantic set that, yeah, you know, that just the, the big cutaway set and where it, and I it's mean, like a it, motel it, for ladies, right? I can't no, no, no. That's the, that's the, oh, no, no, no. You guys are thinking of the ladies, man, which was a color movie. This is a black and white movie. Okay. 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 The and his bro. character, okay. His character is completely silent throughout the entire movie. Okay. Shot at the Fountain Blue. There's a lot of visual gags. This is the scene. He goes into like a conference room and he's smoking a big cigar. And again, he's he never speaks. But they play this great jazz thing. And it's him pretending to be like a big CEO yelling at all his subordinates and stuff. And it's one of those great pantomime Jerry Lewis uh, moments and stuff. But it's uh, it's an interesting movie. Uh, and, and again, Cinderella in the meantime... Uh, yeah, Henry plays one of uh, Jerry's evil uh, stepbrothers and uh, obviously follows the Cinderella thing. But I, uh, I just got to say, what? I've not seen it um, because it's a Jerry Lewis movie. But go on. <laughs> In the meantime, lots of television. Uh, he did uh, Stagecoach West. He did uh, the Joey Bishop show. Yikes. Uh, speaking of things that you don't need to see. Um, he's, wow, I didn't realize... He's also in another Rat Pack movie. He's in Sergeant's Three. Yeah, yeah, he's there. Uh, Western it, Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I mean, he was clearly close with those guys because uh, not the jump yeah. ahead, but Cannonball Run Two. Uh, oh. Sadly true. <laughs> that <laughs> Frank's in Cannonball Run Two as well. But while yeah. we talk about Frank and Ocean's Eleven of stuff, we we um, it was Manchurian next or was Johnny Cool next? Johnny Cool. I think Johnny okay. Cool was next. So. Which yeah. is almost a Rat Pack movie itself. A hundred percent, man. Yeah. Yes, the uh, yeah, the the uh, the cast of Johnny Cool is pretty amazing, actually. Like, uh, because I mean, it's it was directed by William Asher, right? And mm -hmm. he's one of those, you know. I mean, uh, you know, he's a TV guy, right? I mean, he was, yes. you know, he's bewitched and everything, right? The weird thing this is, is, this is the year before Bewitched, right? Right, and, and this is where and life. And this is where he met Elizabeth Montgomery. Yes. And yes, and right. also along with uh, the TV directing that he did, and he did a ton of it, he also did several of the beach movies, Beach Blanket Bingo, and yeah. How to Stuff a Wild Bikini, those kind of movies and mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, yeah, he was just a rip em, kind of crank it out director, and it made sense for him to be so successful in television yeah i mean but, uh, and he certainly brings some of that how to stuff a wild bikini style to uh um uh, johnny cool <laughs> or lack thereof. thereof yeah absolutely yeah, yeah man. Uh, johnny, man johnny cool is kind of is 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 strange because the subject matter is really dark and it starts off dark in like the 40s in sicily and it starts off really exciting 
um, everything also, that takes place in Italy. Just Godfather 2 wise, it has the same opening scene as Godfather. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And that's uh, and and also um, even prior to that, I would say it's the mirror reverse of the first Godfather movie in that it's it starts in Sicily. He's a young and, man and you know, comes to America rather than Michael going to Sicily to hide out and everything. Sure. Uh, so I, mean, I love it. Also, I love it. He uh, he very distinguishing that, that he like that he uh, he has the fakest fake beard in the world that doesn't like match the color of his hair at the beginning of it. And like, I mean, just, you know, for the for this show, you know, I always put on the suit and I put on this fake beard. But I think that it, you know, <laughs> mine kind of just fits a little bit better than his did. So um, the you should have worn uh, sunglasses to uh, I know those. I tried to I tried to find some really weird <laughs> wraparound sunglasses to wear. But I think I came uh, uh, he, <laughs> he a couple like of a... things to note about Johnny Cool uh, by by virtue of playing Sicilian, uh, he's playing his actual ethnicity. It's pretty rare. Actually. The only time ever, maybe. Yeah, yeah right. Be the yes. only time. Comes up later. <laughs> Comes up later in his yeah, career. That's true. That's true. Um, but, but yeah, you're right about that. Well, the, and again, the cast well, is nuts. Yeah, I was going to say, yes, man, yeah. and here for the poster and everybody, uh, Jim Backus, Joey Bishop. Um, I'm going to just name the names that we all know. John MacGyver, yeah. uh, Mort John Saul, Saul, the stand-up Mort, comedian. Okay, Mort that's Saul. one of the crazy things. Mort Saul, in a completely dramatic role, has a very small role. <laughs> But it's it's kind of point. It's one of the most poignant movie points in a very non poignant movie. Um, and Tell it is just, just <laughs> to the fact that it's Mort Saul gives it some kind of character. It's one of the, it's one of the best parts of the film. Even though when he gets to America, the film becomes a lot more rote. Um, yeah. It is that point. That part's really cool. But I love it. It's 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 again. It's cheese, but it's entertaining cheese. And I, I'm sorry, I'll I'll be a, I'll be very uh, you know uh, a male and then point out how lovely Elizabeth Montgomery not, is in this movie. She any, she was. You're not going to get any disagreement over here. Well, no. I, I was just going to say she yeah. was a great femme fatale years before she was bewitched. Okay, and she's just she <laughs> great. Great is such a strong word used about anything about this movie, but it's but like it is a fun movie in its way. It's certainly yeah. a big weird mess of a movie. Uh, and she, you could, I, I, she's not great in it either even though i really like her and i think no. that she's somebody who went on to do better stuff you know? well i mean she also did oh god what was cassavetti's uh tv show uh oh, johnny staccato, staccato. staccato. Yeah, yeah yeah she's very big in the johnny uh genre <laughs> yes. of things yeah but she but she's like a you know she's a sexy minx in that movie as well and uh my the thing i want to say is also uh, it's free. It's on YouTube. You can watch uh, Johnny Cool for free. Yeah. So Unfortunately, that... the quality is really bad, but there's not really a good another good way to watch it. I mean, maybe there's and... a DVD out there somewhere, but uh, you know. Oh, I should say, there is a service called Screen Picks, which uh, you can subscribe to on the Roku channel, which is yes. what I did. Uh, it is clear. I think it's a VHS rip. It's 4.3, although the movie might yeah. be 4.3 too. Yeah. Could have been. Uh, no, well, yeah. no, 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 it can't be. It can't be. It's okay, from nineteen sixty. It's not. Right? It's not bad quality, but it is a VHS. Oh, 63, 63. Yeah. Yeah, but they were still making four three movies, knowing that eventually they would be on TV. In fact, I, I was listening yeah. to Dante, Joe Dante, discuss that very nature of of certain films. Well, they were protecting much. for four three. That's right. not the same thing. Right. Like that's oh, okay. uh, like it, okay. you know when the um you know when a a, a a 185 movie was is just the top and bottom of it matted off, right? And so, like, uh, it, it's you can you're just making sure there I aren't understand. booms in the shot and shit like that. For it. yeah, because yeah, literally, I was listening to Dante and Josh Olson's um podcast, and he made the point that it used to be literally illegal to show the black bars of yeah. a widescreen film. Sure, and that's a, sure. you know, so like an FCC rule that you couldn't do that, isn't that weird? Right. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's strange but, to think that this film would be shown on TV because not to be too purient, but um, hyper violent. Uh, Elizabeth no, Montgomery shows a lot of skin for 1963. I it I actually was like, oh, this this is this 1963. People yeah. must kids guys must have been going out of their minds yeah oh my. actually um to to make it even more gross and purient but uh like supposedly there was like some brutal rape scene in this movie that there, then got it's, cut it's or something. heavily implied like, 
Yeah, but like they shot the scene and oh, they, they shot it? cutting oh. it. Yeah, 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 that's what I. Well, and and again, there's tons of publicity photos of Elizabeth in various states of undress. Yeah, uh, there's a, there's the whole thing there. of of Silva uh, and um, Elizabeth Montgomery with her in a bikini. We should say the, the most notable thing about Johnny Cool is it stars Henry Silva, and he's yes. most of the time he was a supporting guy, an antagonist. Uh, he is an antagonistic character, but he is the star, the yeah, yeah. Male character of the very, film. Very and rare. it's the yeah. and it's the first film that Peter Lawford ever produced. Yeah, which I yeah. find it, and the, and you got to watch the trailer because the trailer is fantastic, and Peter Lawford is even in it. And in fact, I remember seeing an episode of um, Password that Peter Lawford was a was a contestant. <laughs> oh on. yeah. Oh wait, and, I've and, seen this too. <laughs> And they ask Alan Lux, like, oh, what do you got coming up, Peter? Well, uh, nothing. I just produced a film called uh, Johnny Cool. And it's so, you know. Uh, here's, but the thing about, here's the thing about Password. Password and Alan Ludden. He's obsessed with who produced movies. Like, whenever somebody is on and they're talking about a movie that's coming up, he asks who the producer is. It's Interesting. A, it, it, and, like, uh, you know, is it, uh, oh, my God, I just watched one recently where he, you know, I now I can't remember. It, it, somebody, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but he's like, uh, oh, well, if he produced it, there'll be some beautiful uh, wardrobe in that one. And like, <laughs> did, what? did he want to get into producing? Is that it? I don't know. You he's thinking? just obs apparently obsessed with uh, with producers. I mean, he's, he is, still, uh, kind, he's of a time when you would have talked about the producer more than the director. Yeah. In a lot of ways. I, you, so, know, you know, well, and also I like one where Betty White is one of the contestants and they talk about how they're going to go on the road. Uh, on stage doing Bell Book and Candle, the Kim Novak, Jimmy yeah, Stewart thing. Yeah, sure, and it's yeah. like, all right, put Alan London as Jimmy Stewart and put Betty White as uh, Kim oh, Novak. Wow. Sure, yeah. sure. Great. Look, as long as at the end they sit on the edge of the stage and sign some autographs, it's fine. You know, all right, last last moment about Betty White and Alan London. Apparently they were incredibly kind to David Letterman when he when he they they did, or he, I should say Ludden did Dave Letterman's Indianapolis radio talk show. Mm. And he impressed him so much that when the Letterman went to LA, uh, Ludden is like, Hey, I'll do everything I can to help you put him on game shows that he was producing and stuff. So I, I just love that kind of like, as much as it's easy to like laugh at, and I'm totally fine laughing at Alan Ludden, apparently you're like really good guy. So what are you well, going to do? No, I, not, <laughs> not running down Alan Ludden, just a curious man, very interested in production. Back to Henry Silva, the Manchurian Candidate. God, I love this movie. Um, I was in college. Uh, the great story about that movie is, of course, it came out in 1960. Um, you know, movies, I don't really, you know, I don't have the knowledge to know uh, after an initial run how much of a film might run on, on, you know, still in theaters or whatever. But obviously the movie is about an assassination attempt of a, uh, of a presidential candidate. And... Um, when uh, when the Kennedy assassination happened, the movie really was kind of pulled back, and Sinatra didn't realize uh, not only was he the star, but he was really one of the co-producers that he basically owned the rights to the movie, as I understood the story. Hmm. And literally in the mid '80s, they were going over his assets, and it's like, hey man, uh, you, hey, hey man, I don't know if you know this. But, uh, you know, you, you, Sammy you know, it was his accountant at that point. Yeah. Well, as we know from uh, Johnny Cool, he was educated. I love that. I meant to mention that about Johnny Cool. His character's name is Educated. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, and, but, and donning the eye patch. Uh, indeed. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Come on. But, um, but yeah, his, his lawyers are like, you know, you own the movie. And he's like, well, let's get it back out there. This is a good movie. It's a great movie. It's oh, an yeah. amazing movie. And Silva is um, part of what is considered to be one of the first kung fu sequences in American film. I have uh, uh, I have uh, f a photo evidence of said. Uh, okay, scene. good. Yeah, he uh, he scene. plays he plays uh, Lawrence Harvey's houseboy. What are you gonna do? Uh, again, here he is as a Korean um, soldier, uh, and uh, in the midst of them being brainwashed. But uh, great fight scene. Yeah, but then uh, yeah, you get Henry in his stance, and then you got Francis, <laughs> Bruce Lee, Sinatra, everybody. Yeah, 
I love that scene. It's, yeah, no, it's, it's really good stuff. Like, and it's yeah. Frankenheimer, John Frankenheimer directed yep. it. You know, if, if anybody watched our kinescope stuff, we talked about Frankenheimer endlessly, you know, for good reason. You know, uh, he, he had an amazing early career. Yes. And uh, George you know, Axelrod. Like, early career. Really, We're not going to talk about the island of Dr. Moreau. When John Frankenheimer dies and we do a memorial for him, we can talk about that. He's okay. dead. Um, I, I know. <laughs> Look, I'm just trying. To I would love on. to. I'd be very happy to do a, a Frankenheimer <laughs> retrospective. He's amazing. No, let's let's do it. There's some there's some ugly business in there too. Like there's, yeah, that, that's uh, sure that'd be good worth getting into. Absolutely. My uh, a good friend of mine, a, a film critic here uh, in Chicago for the Tribune, Mark Caro, had the opportunity to interview him. I believe around the time of, if not, I think it was Reindeer Games that that was his opportunity. Yeah, Charles was around. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I just so, actually there was a um I mean sorry I didn't mean to cut you off if there's more, but the um but the there was just recently a Kyle McLaughlin uh you know in the criterion closet, you know those videos where yeah, uh, you know where somebody dream. goes and picks out movies and then talks about them. The uh he was he was in that uh he was in a in a like a HBO movie uh that Frank and I were directed when he was kind of like you know, kind of climbing back, and uh, and he he had some interesting things to say about Frank and I'm yeah, and talked about him quite a bit. It's really interesting and worth checking out that video. Good to know, absolutely. Um, again, uh, the the pattern of Silva playing Asians continued, and I point this out because I do think it's a slick '60s spy movie, and that is the Return of Mr. Moto, uh, and and Silva plays Moto again, another movie that you could find. On uh, on YouTube, Mr. Moto, of course, famously played by uh, Peter Lorre uh, during the 40s, another actor that would play various ethnicities. Mm -hmm. But um, the reason why I find this interesting was Mr. Moto went from being kind of a classic Mr. Wong, Charlie Chan sort of detective. In this movie, he's an Interpol uh, secret agent and running around. And I and, I, and again, I, I ex accepted the contextually for what it is. But it's a, it's a, to me, it's a slick '60s uh, black and white spy movie. And again, that free was, on YouTube. That was that era when, because James Bond was so huge, um, every character was being that they were they were trying to turn into a '60s spy. Mm -hmm. uh, Bulldog Drummond, yeah, I was gonna uh, say that. Character <laughs> yeah. from like the '30s <laughs> that yeah. like influenced Ian Fleming. They're the two. They're, they're not good films, but they are entertaining. They're uh, fun. Really, sixties bulldog drumming films, which um, I think are actually a lot of fun. Dead, deadlier than the male, in deadlier particular. than the male. Yeah, uh, but no, I agree with you, man. Yeah, he went from being, uh, uh, like you said, kind of a gentleman detective to a secret agent. Richard Johnson, who Richard Johnson, yes, I'm a big fan, and you know, even uh, as late as uh, the great um, show with Martin Clunes, uh, Doc Martin uh, even showed up in yeah. in that in the you know about ten years ago or so. And I'm a no, I'm a big Richard. In fact, I, I just taped uh, on Turner Classic Movies today. They were doing a, a Sofia Lorenda day, and right. he's uh, one of the main stars. Yes, he he was one of the main stars of Operation Crossbow. That's right. And uh, mid '60s uh, fun uh, World War II movie and stuff. So no, I'm a, I'm a Richard Johnson fan. But yeah, I honestly like uh, you know James C Coburn with the Flint movies. Flint movies, which Even, again I think are a lot of fun. I agree, sure. and even even as terrible as he treats women, the Dean Martin Man Hell movies have always been among my favorite spy movies growing up as a kid. These are all of the movies. Like, I worked on the Austin Powers movies, so, like, the first Austin Powers, like, these are all of the movies we watched, oh, you know? The Man like, Hell uh, movies? Yeah. I could, sh I, I, there are scenes that you could take out and you could convince someone they're Austin Power. Yeah. Well, 100%. I, they, and yeah. that was just, I mean, my, my first couple of days on the movie was just going into the office and watching a bunch of shit like this, you know? Uh, so like it, it, you know, back then when it was harder to get a hold of. Did they show, by the way, this is off topic, whatever. No, did, go. Did they show Sweet Charity the first Fosse movie as part of Austin Powers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We watched Sweet Charity. So yeah, much of the yeah. choreography in Austin Powers. Oh yeah, is, is yeah, from that, Sweet Charity. Ref, yeah, that was a specific reference. Okay. Too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's Rhythm of Life. This the song that Sammy yeah, performs Sammy in Davis that Singer. movie. That is a that is truly one of his best moments on film. He is so yeah. great dancing. I mean, it's it's creepy. There's a lot of middle aged hippies 
That, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, there there's some there's some uncomfortable, or at least just awkward shit about it. But I mean, that that movie, I just rewatched this movie. Like, I got a Blu-ray, but I'm a oh, big Bob Fosse fan, <laughs> like Bob sure. Fosse, the director fan, especially. But also, you know, him as a choreographer. And uh, I uh, and so I was rewatching this Blu-ray, and it's just like. It's one of those movies that you want to like for the individual bits of it, but it's just yeah. too much and too a lot of like he's just yeah. try, just like stylistically too much. Just just he's throwing everything at it, and he didn't really figure shit out until Cabaret. But like you're uh, right, you know. But the um, and then you know, and I think became one of the most like uh, unsung influential directors that uh, you know going because certainly well, Mark Scorsese, sung. he won an Oscar. <laughs> Yeah, but people but don't talking, think about Bob Fosse right. that way now. I know, like the um, it's I'm with you know, Gabe. and it's a, I mean, he's being rehabilitated in that way a little bit. They just did a whole series uh, on uh, Blank Check, the podcast Blank Check about him, you know. But like, I think that the um, that he's one of those guys that he just yeah, he won an Oscar at the time. A lot of people won Oscars. Most of it's garbage, but the you know, but like he uh, he like <laughs> he just. <laughs> He no, is not you, somebody who's given credit for some of the innovative stylistic things that he yeah. brought. You know, when you discuss when you discuss seventies directors, he should be there in the top yeah. five. He and, should, and it's just because he only. Made, I think it's partly, even though people remember those movies, and remember Cabaret, you know, to a lesser extent, Lenny, you know, uh, um, and all that jazz. All that they jazz. don't like. They don't, it's because he doesn't have as big of a body of work, maybe. Yes, yeah, and yes. also because people think of him as the choreographer and, right, and not right. not so much as the director. But I, I do think that he's, I mean, and seriously, Lenny, like the Martin Scorsese Lenny. is like, it's like Lenny is his dad, you know? Like there's so much, you know, that movie, because it's like it, he takes so much from it. Nothing against 100%. Scorsese. I love him. Yeah. The great, the great Valerie Perrine in that film, and yes. uh, yeah, she was best role ever. Yeah, I, probably, I probably. believe she was nominated for an Oscar. I don't know if that means anything to Gabe, but it probably yeah, meant a lot to her. no garbage. But uh, but she's great. Her actual performance is great. Yeah, <laughs> she's amazing in it. No, it's you uh, just know yeah. her from Superman or Can't Stop the Music. Watch, yeah, well, yeah that poor. You know, I know I that poor thing was on such a great role with Slaughterhouse Five. Lenny, oh, that's right. She's a Slaughterhouse Five, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and then unfortunately, can't stop the music. Really, kind of screwed her over. And yeah, yeah, yeah. it's you know, but a lot of great, career. great documentary about her. And I had the filmmaker on. I would have loved to talk to Valerie, but the poor thing is suffering very seriously from that. I believe she has like yeah. sick. Yeah, and yeah. and she's yeah. been very sweet to me, and and actually even sent me very nice uh, private texts saying thank you so much. I'm, I'm but please talk to the filmmaker. Yeah, was happy to do it. And it's great. It really, really is great. It's only about 40 minutes long, but it is still running at uh, various uh, film festivals and stuff. What, and and you what's appreciate it. Called? Do you, do you I will look it up. Title? I will tell you. Uh, Just to give shortly. it a plug. Um, Certainly. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, wait, how do we get to Bob Fosse? What, what? <laughs> uh, because we're talking about Austin Powers stuff. So oh, right, 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 right. The 60s spot. Let's well, back yeah, we should probably get, charity. get somewhere it, near Henry Silva. It's uh, called Valerie. It's okay, simply cool, called Valerie, cool, cool. and it is, and it's got a 2022 uh, release date and everything. And again, it's running in. Uh, you can you can actually even rent it on Vimeo. So really, really seek it out, everybody, because it is. It's it's just outstanding, and it re reminds us how great she was. So Silva, I want to see other other 60s roles again. A lot of TV along with these movies. I mean, to um, take it back to where we started he was in the two outer limits episodes yes so, you're yeah, right about you know, that uh, never so, in a twilight zone but yeah, two outer well limits. yeah who cares about the twilight zone he was in the outer limits and that's what we care about over here uh i, did, I don't know i don't know if you in the audience know this but we did an entire podcast about every episode of the outer limits a couple of years ago and uh and he's in two of them the mice and uh, tourist, the attraction. tourist attraction. Uh, That's the, right. The mice is the one that you know as a uh, as a, as a there's a big walking jello mold that runs around. Yes. Uh, and uh, and then uh, tourist attraction is the one with the goofy fish and Ralph Meeker. And uh, Henry Silva plays uh, a kind of you know South American despot or something. And, yeah, military. Uh, really yeah. based on Fidel Ca Castro. Castro. Yeah, right. yeah, a Castro yeah. style character. Yeah. Going back to Johnny Cool, I really felt his beard was very. 
he looked very Castro esque in uh, when he had the beard in uh, Johnny. Cruz. Yes, he he's the he, he's like the the lowest fake Castro on the totem pole. Like when Castro sends out a double, like you know, uh, it, it's it's like all right, we got to go with this guy. Like he's it's not a great beard, but but we're gonna. Uh, but his, <laughs> his performance in the mice is great, and it's the is one of the things that elevates the episode. It yes. is in that great tradition of the outer limits that we talked about which is they take a sci-fi story and then they put a criminal in it, uh, which is a fantastic way to tell a story because it uh, makes everything a lot more interesting. Yeah, yeah. there's Agreed. tension there. There's built-in tension. Yeah. Uh, I just want to acknowledge some of the great TV shows that he did during this period, uh, and, and some not so great. Uh, he did Ben Gazzara's show, Run for Your Life. He did uh, The Plains. Well, The Plainsman, he was a movie that he was in. Uh, another movie he was in, The Hills Run Red. He was in the Tarzan TV series. A lot of a lot of westerns. Uh, Laredo. Uh, the first episode, the pilot episode for the very interesting ninety minute long, only one season, Simmer and Strip, which starred uh, Stuart Whitman, and uh, he was in the first episode along with John Saxon, hmm. uh, ironically, and they yeah. and they were they were great in that. I was really trying to find footage of it. I couldn't find it, but it's it really was a, a great. Uh, television role for him and and for Saxon for that matter. Hawaii Five O. It takes a thief. Yeah, I, I just want to say, according to my mom, Linda Hunsaker, uh, uh, she remembers him in Adventures in Paradise, The Untouchables, Mission Impossible, Wagon Train, and Hawaii Five O. There you go. Absolutely, man. And then we get into the seventies, and I love this period because and and I, I alerted uh, the boys to um, this incredible documentary. Yes, uh, Silva, like a lot of other great Amer, well a lot of great character actors of American and British film went to Italy. Well, first of all, Silva started making uh, spaghetti Westerns at the late period of the Italian spaghetti Westerns. But then as they tr transitioned to crime, Silva made several uh, really fun uh, movies, including The Boss, uh, which is a great movie, um, you know, or a fun movie, I should say, Crime Busters, which uh, is him and, and Antonio Sabato Sr., Okay, and I just got to stop you right here. If you watch this documentary, and oh my god, what what Antonio Sabato Senior is wearing in that fucking thing with the uh like the 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 pink vest with the pink shirt underneath it, it's I'm not doing it justice. You have to watch this thing just to see. But yeah. Antonio Sabato Senior. It does not come off well in that documentary. <laughs> no. Uh, he, both in terms of um, uh, behavior or at least uh, commentary and fashion. Oh, my God. The fashion <laughs> is so overwhelming. I barely <laughs> noticed what he said. He, uh, the movie is called Eurocrime, all one word, Eurocrime. Yeah. And it is the deepest dive on Italian crime movies ever made. And it is so detail-oriented. It's over two hours long. And everybody, it's on Tubi for free. If you can yeah, handle commercials. Uh, and, and, of course, we're of the generation that commercials don't bother us. It is great. Christopher Mitchum is in it. John Saxon is yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, and, and they all have very interesting things. And, of course, our, we got to make our Star Trek connection, as we always do. Um, oh, God. The guy who played Michael Apollo. Forrest. Michael Forrest. Thank Michael you very Forrest much. did a lot of dubbing. Okay. Both. He did on screen and he did a lot of dubbing. Okay. Yeah. Yes. He was did it both. Michael Forrest in an Outer Limits as well? I can't remember. Yeah. He was I, in yes, he was. Uh, was he uh, the one with Ed Asner. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. On, oh, the, it was that one? I yeah. forgot yeah. that it was yeah. that episode. Uh, He's the guy who gets killed first. Guy yeah. Gets Michael the, Forrest also, uh, he also plays the priest that used to date Laura Petrie and Dick Van Dyke, where uh, oh, yeah. Dick yeah. meets him right. on the golf course, has no idea that he's a priest, finds out that he used to date Laura, and he's all ready to get him. And then he, yeah. Michael Force walks in with the collar. He's like, oh, uh, father, how you doing? And he tries to set her up him up with uh, Rosemary. She's like, where's this attractive priest you're trying to set me up with? <laughs> right. right. Great, great Rosemary moment. Very, yeah. very speaking, fun. Speaking of Star Trek, um, just as an aside, when I was going over Silva's IMDb, kind of crazy he didn't do a Star Trek. True. Yeah. And I yeah. kind of wish he did. Because oh, sure, he, yeah. frankly, he would have made a, again because of his facial features. Would have made a great Romulan. Would have made a great Klingon. He would have made a great Klingon. For some reason, him. We'll get to it later. Him and Michael and Sara, their careers intertwine in a weird way. And I'm. It probably was a 
coin flip between yeah. the two of them. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But Michael Ansara and also, you know, just Ricardo Montalban, right? Like, yeah. I mean, he's another guy who was kind of, at that point in his career, kind of did roles like that. I would love Even, to see Silva as, as Khan. As, as much as I love Montalban. I, yeah, no. It would, Silva would have been a great Khan. He wouldn't have been, been as good of a Khan in the movie, but he but he would have been a great yeah. Khan in Space Seed. Yeah, TV. Yeah. TV yeah. Khan, sure. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. But I do I, – I find these movies fascinating. Um, again, a lot – you can find a lot of them on Tubi. Some of them are dubbed. Some of them are still in just Italian. Well, they're all uh, – they're all I mean well they're one functionally of the all dubbed because they never shot sync sound. They don't do live sound. And yeah. it, by the way, right. the Italian film industry, it was as if an entire country was Roger Corman. Uh yes. they were just pumping things out. The they make a point in Italy at that time, not a lot of movies were shown on TV. So Italian uh just the, the people in Italy were going to the movies all the time. Big moviegoers, yes. Uh, and so they were. This country was pumping out movies. Well, and they would and they would move from genre to genre. Everyone yeah. went to Italy to do the sword and sandal Ben Hur's yeah, and Steve movies. Yeah. yeah, and then yeah, and then and then we got the Italian knockoffs. They moved to spaghetti westerns, and and it continued and everything until they they squeezed that sponge until it had no moisture, and yeah. then they moved on to Italian crime and horror in the seventies. And and truly, they're they're very very interesting movies. Uh, they're not good, but they're very violent and they're very expressive. And as as you said, Ian, they they were shot without sound, so they yeah. could be dubbed not only in English and Italian, yeah. but or in other languages as yeah. well. German. But that's also just how um, it's it's not that these were like you know that these junkie movies were uh, were the things that were shot that way and dubbed. It's Everything. you know Bellini movies are dubbed, right? It's, sure. They, yes. The entire Italian industry shot you know, MOS and then would, you know, dub everything after the fact, the, uh, you know, and with these, with these, these movies, particularly though, that would bring in international actors like the, you know, the spaghetti Westerns and then these, these crime movies, people would be showing up, like just speaking whatever they spoke. Right. Yeah. And so the, you know, like they're not, you know, that's the, there's, it wouldn't have ever worked to, you know, to record sync no. sound for him no. anyway, you know? Absolutely. But Martin Balsam, Jack Palance, no. uh, I that love them. a lot of them. I've got, yes. I mean, this was, yeah. this was a canon movie, but, I, and, and uh, Woody Strode, who's right there at dead center, the violent breed. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, he was, he, you know, and I, of course we love Woody Strode from Pompey from, uh, from well, Liberty also Valance. Also managed yeah. Liberty Valance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, and I gotta say, Jack, pa like as a as a comp, Jack Palance and uh, and Henry oh, Silva have a little bit of a common, you know, uh, you know, like that and yeah, totally. Forget totally. Travolta yeah. and Cage. Yes. I watched Face Off with Silva and <laughs> Palance. Oh, that's interesting. That would have been great. Those Was it well, big bones? You cut your finger on them. Yeah. Okay. Look, I guess look, it, the, it, the time is coming where we can do uh, oh, we, can, we can make this movie through, yes. through the magic of visual effects. Folk, so, if you, you know. want to do a deep fake, uh, that's, deep that's fake the off. one. Deep with, fake off. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and and I face off. I just brought up the poster of the uh, the boss because uh, once again uh, they were together in Ocean's Eleven and so important with their scenes together uh, in the boss. Richard Conte mm, is yeah. uh, is the is the Don. In uh, in that movie, and it's a it's a tremendous movie. Um, again, I I, I uh, and also you really need to watch Euro Crime to appreciate um, his uh, his interview scenes. Here's a, here's a screen cap yeah. of him talking about it and stuff. Because I was really after he passed away, and we decided to do this. I was really searching for any sort of uh, video interviews and and also written interviews that he did. And thank God, I'm like, wait a minute, he's in that Euro Crime thing. Yeah, yeah, there he is. So yeah, it's and he, amazing. He comes well, off as an odd man but uh but like i i know when when it was announced that he died uh joe dante uh had you know tweeted that he was the nicest guy he ever worked with so I it mean, is it's, you know. it's it's weird because he plays bad guys a lot of time and and can be frightening while being quiet yeah um he he talks about how much he hated being especially violent towards women in mm -hmm. his films it was it was very much against his uh uh ethos <laughs> Uh, and uh, they show him the poster for the movie that he's in called 
uh, I believe, Cry of a Prostitute. Yes. And he, like, okay. recoils yes. from it. And it is a <laughs> gnarly poster. It is, like, why would this be shown in public? Yeah. Um, but those films, uh, good taste, never. No, they're very taste. exploitative. They're deliberately exploitative. Yeah. Uh, they do. Uh, ha I'm I'm not uh, an expert in these movies, uh, but uh, there's some amazing car stunts in them. Like yeah. that's one of the things I love. You know, like uh, I'm a huge car. You know, uh, stunt. Uh, you know, car crash fan. Well so, covered in know. the well yeah. covered yeah. in the Euro. I mean, that's Absolutely. the thing. I mean, if you don't have, and it does require patience to watch these films. Uh, it doesn't require patience to watch this documentary, Eurocrime, yeah, yeah. and they cover everything. And also, and the, I'm sorry, know, but the only downside about the car thing, they're the shittiest cars. They're like these fucking Italian. That's why they like, didn't you know, like, beat them up. I know, but like they're not cool cars, right? It's like, but, but, th but that's it's also, the only downside. But it's also interesting guerrilla filmmaking where oh, yeah. literally they would just start shooting, and a lot of times, especially given how violent. The real Italian society was, especially during the seventies. People thought sometimes this was real shit going down, and and it was really kind of scary and stuff. And you know, all of a sudden the guy with squibs would get shot, and they're, oh my yeah, god, are you okay? Right. You know, stuff like that. But also, Gabe, as as a movie poster fan, goddamn, some of these some of these posters. Oh yeah, there are some great, just great posters, great posters. Yeah. So I mean, really, I, I should I should really try harder to find uh, stuff like that. Well, then we moved to uh, 1979, and we were kind of dancing around it. We mentioned Michael and Sarah and uh, and Henry Silva having a big, a bit of a uh, connection. Yeah, uh, I, I remember seeing this movie in one of the Jerry Lewis theaters that mm. were. I've always prevalent. heard about them. I don't know if I. Yeah, I, had, I had only heard about that like, yeah. in recent years. Yeah, it was in uh, Elk Grove, one of the Chicago uh, suburbs. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about, about uh, Buck Rogers in the 21st century or 25th century, pardon me. Uh, but there you can see him in the in the bottom left. Uh, of course, Henry Silva was Kane. There's a good picture of him, and yeah, of course, Killer Kane. Killer Kane, indeed. Killer Kane, yes. And uh, you know, it it is what it is. But I I, I enjoyed the film when it came out, and um, you know, it's weird. Jerry Lewis theaters were supposed to be family friendly, friendly, and this movie was rated G. But when Buck goes into his cryogenic sleep he has this very weird during the the title sequence kind of dream state where it's kind of sexual fantasies i mean nobody's nude but it's, but the, it's all, credit, the credit scene where they play the whole theme song with with uh yeah. lyrics yeah, with yeah lyrics. right 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 yeah i and yeah it gets kind I, of uncomfortable i so. never I, I don't i'm pretty sure that i never saw this theatrical version of it really but, uh but i well i was a little kid you know, I guess my mom didn't take me to it. I'm sorry, John, but the uh, like it. But I was I loved the the show, right? Like, I mean, I loved the oh, yeah. you know. I mean, when that was you know, I mean, this is the theatrical version is just the pilot for the show, right? Or two episodes, the first two episodes of the show, or something yeah. like that. I, I yeah. don't know. Yeah, but, no, they uh, ended up. Yeah, they. I mean, they they tr <laughs> they trimmed the dream sequence that we just discussed. Uh -huh. But yeah, pretty much. And uh, man, I'll tell you, everyone remembers Princess Sardala. Boom. And yeah, Tiger yeah. Man there in the background. Tiger, uh, the Tiger Man. <laughs> I yeah, I don't it, like. I I loved the show when I was a kid, uh, but he's not in the show, right? That's that's where we yeah. get to the, the Michael Ansar. Michael, Michael Ansar replaces him. Film. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, we should say uh, he never did a Twilight Zone. He did do a Night Gallery. Mm. I didn't realize that. Uh, he in an episode called The Doll. Funny enough, Telly Savalas is Johnny Cool. Uh, castmate is mm -hmm. in a very famous Twilight Zone episode about a doll that befuddles a Tina. man. Uh, Henry Silva is in an episode also written by Rod Serling about a doll that is not as interesting. Uh, about it, it deals with uh, British colonialism in India. Guess who plays the uh, Indian um, in in that episode? <laughs> uh, Ina Turban. Now I will say, and one wow. thing about Henry Silva. From everything I've seen, uh, no matter who he plays or what ethnicity, he always um, – he's never doing um, – um, shall we say a Tunish accent. There's right, always yeah. a dignity to it. He's not yes, – yes. um, he, he is always uh, being uh, respectful and, and, and earnest and serious. Uh, but it is, it is like, oh, just another uh, ticking off the box of how many – uh, ethnicities, this, the, the, they, they would just cast this guy as anything, right. absolutely. Well, let's move on to uh, the horror film that I didn't expect to watch, but I really enjoyed, 
And that, of course, is Alligator. Yeah. And there's, and, there, there's a lot of good stuff in this and certainly an amazing cast. Yes. Uh, and uh, and he's also, you know, reunited with uh, Michael Gazzo, who uh, wrote Half Full of Rape. Uh, his uh, his studio, you know, uh, um, right. after studio, uh, you know, studio mate. And, uh, and folks, Al there's a lot of reasons to watch Alligator. John Sales wrote a lot of movies uh, for, uh, I believe this was a New World era. Yeah, uh, that era. sounds right. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, John Sales would always take these movies, genre films, and elevate them um, in, a, in a really cool way. Uh, this is one of them. But also... Henry Silva, for all intents and purposes, is playing Craven the Hunter in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, he's great. He would have been a great Craven. You're absolutely yes, right. He's that. basically they basically an alligator is a giant alligator uh, in the sewers is bedeviling people. Robert Forrester is the cop on the case. Yeah, and but it, the, yeah. the authorities call in this hunter, and it's it's Henry Silva. Absolutely, and and it's. it's Go ahead. No, go ahead, John. No, I was just going to say it takes place in Chicago, which I love. And That's also, right. yeah, it like, is a thousand percent shot in Los Angeles. There is nothing. I mean, like, I have, literally, right. I can go through it and tell you where all those locations are. At, like, they at, make no attempt to disguise it. Well, at, at, at other than at the opening of the film, the little girl that buys the baby alligator that eventually grows to this mutant gigantic size uh, you hear a radio go, well, and uh, today at the 1968 Democratic Convention, yes, that's right. things really went to hell. And it's like, yeah, nice try. Very good. I didn't really, a, I, a I was a little puzzled by to that medium, too. Though, because, yeah, a strange connection to Medium Cool, another a great Robert Forrester movie. Uh, yes, no, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and Forrester is really good in this, you know, like yeah, he's, he's uh, amazing. Uh, yes. I mean, he was always great. It's got a great cast. Um, Gazzo's and, great as the uh, uh, as the captain, the police captain, and, and everything. You know, I actually like uh, um, Robin Riker, who yes, plays from Get a Life. Maiden. From Get a Life. From Get a Life. Like, That's you know, the only other thing my... I've seen her in. I agree. I know. I, I didn't remember this at all, and then I was like, "Holy <laughs> shit!" Like, because you know, like uh, you yeah. know, she plays uh, his his neighbor's uh, wife you know, in yeah. uh, in Get a Life, uh, which is. Just top, it's one of my top 10 shows of all time. One of the best and, 90s uh, sitcoms, yes. You know, and uh, so like, uh, the, I just I just wanted to point that out. But like the rest of the cast is pretty nuts too. Like there's so many uh, um, just like, uh, you know, Dean Jagger and uh, Jack Carter. and Yes, uh, Jack Carter. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I meant to grab, I forgot to grab a, a still of Jack Carter in this. It's like, you know, come on, Jack yeah. Carter. Because <laughs> other than this, he was doing Love Boat, basically, yes. at this point yeah. in his career. Yeah. Um, I wanted to point out Amazon Women on the Moon. Oh, can uh, I just say one thing about Alligator oh, real quick? Of course, please. The keep on. Alligator is amazing, right? Yeah. Like the full-size puppet alligator is one of the best things like right. it beats the shit out of the shark in jaws right and oh, jaws yeah. is one of the greatest movies ever i just actually saw that i'm actually release of it uh at the at the chinese theater yeah uh, and it was amazing but the uh it's always amazing but the um like it, but that alligator like there's a whole this whole sequence where it like eats a bunch of people in beverly hills which is somehow in chicago i don't know uh and uh like <laughs> the um and it just looks great. And like, I, I don't know, I was just super impressed by that. And within the first minute, someone uh, gets bit by an alligator and it's gushing blood. And it's yeah. not even a minute, it, like not Robert even two Forster's minutes into the movie. Partner, oh, yeah. He loses his partner. To yes, that that's, that's the big right. like, thematic thing that comes around. He makes it uh, personal. I got to say, the one thing about this movie that uh that i have a really hard time with is there's a thousand percent too many dead dogs in it like there are there there's there's like there's gotta eat 40 dead dogs in this movie and i it's it's too much for me a lot of i'm just i'm just warning any other soft hearted people out. but it's uh but you know it, it it is a horror movie but it to me it's really more of a you know, sci you know, science gone wrong movie it's because a, it's the a creature feature. It's a creature. It is a creature. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's more of a creature feature than it is a slasher movie or or whatever horror genre you prefer. But I, uh, I, yeah. So it, it was. I was pleasantly surprised how much I yeah. was entertained by it. Well, and so, this is just I mean, John Sayles, and you know, there's yeah, it's, yeah. it's a, a well-made movie too. 
It is. It is a, for being a low budget movie. It is a well made movie. I agree. So Amazon Women of the Moon, uh, uh, a uh, John uh, Landis film, kind of another uh, take on Joe Dante. It's a few guys. Oh, yeah, Carl yeah. Gottlieb. Oh, Carl yes, Gottlieb. Yeah, no, that's right. Carl Gottlieb. But yeah, it's like like Kentucky Fried movie. It's a series yeah, of vignettes. Like yeah, and um, and Silva's is basically a send up of Jack Palance when he was doing uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. And uh, and it's Silva as himself, and uh, his TV show is called Bullshit or Not. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's just it's just Henry Silva being Henry Silva, and still talking in that very Henry Silva way. He yeah. can't help it, and it is. It's just I I had forgotten that he was in it when I was going through his IMDb page. I'm like, oh yeah, that's yeah, right. He no, was in Amazon I, Women I, on the Moon. I, I didn't remember it either until I was looking through this stuff. But Russ it, Meyer, it, it was funny stuff. Russ Meyer did a segment. Joe Dante did a segment. Uh, Landis, Ross I think, is Meyer did a segment. What? All right, I gotta yes, go back did. and look at this. Yes, he did. Uh, Arsenio Hall is yeah, in it in a very a pre coming to America in his talk show, Arsenio Hall role. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting, and that's movie. the this is the one with the Carl Gottlieb Invisible Man thing, right? Ed Begley uh, Jr., yeah. Jr., yes, right? yeah. yeah, yes, that's right. I forgot about that, absolutely, man. Yeah, I mean, it's look, it's ridiculous. But it's again, if you if you enjoy if you appreciate cheese, it's fun. Yeah, and I haven't seen I I don't think I've seen it since like I was a kid and it was on VHS or whatever. Saw so, it in the uh, theater. Saw it in the theater. Yeah. Sybil Danning, uh, they do. Um, I guess was it like Queen of what was the the Zsa Zsa Gabor Queen of Mars? Oh yeah, um, and then uh, you know yes. kind of uh, yeah right yeah something. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was kind of a lift of that, and it's. Um, Sybil Danning and uh, oh god, the lead in uh, Steve Forrest. As I said, the lead yeah. in SWAT. Uh, yeah, so that that's like one of the longer parodies that that's in the movie. But it's a lot of fun, and it, it's a, I mean, it's a send up of movies just like Kentucky Fried Movie was, just like another movie called Loose Shoes uh, was another film like that. Sure. The Groove uh, Tube. The, yes, the Groove Tube. Absolutely. That is something. That is an era of time. I don't think we'll ever come back to that, which is the Probably sketch not. show movie. Because mm -hmm. now you would just make clips, you just make videos. There, oh, yeah, there was a movie called Film Number 42. That oh, movie had, 43. Movie, yeah. movie 43, yeah. right? Right. I'm yeah. sort of fascinated by that movie. That is a but not a good. Thing. Yeah. My not my good. my good friend Julianne Emery in uh, movie 43. I'm sure that she's gotta, great in it. I was gonna say yeah, an that's, indictment of the actors, okay? No, no, she's a lot of amazing acts. actors. Yeah, no, no, but I'm just saying that I know somebody that was in movie. No, she's been killing it in streaming TV. She doesn't need to list it anymore, and I would never embarrass her to talk about that. Man, when I talked to uh, Tim Matheson, forgive the name drop, of about 1941, the wince on his face, I'm like, and thank God we didn't do video. And I'm like, no, 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 Tim, it's not a perfect movie, but yeah. you've got great scenes in it, man. It's like, it's you know, okay. You know, when I was talking to William Atherton the other day, um, the... <laughs> No, go ahead. Sorry. You know, when I was talking to Eddie <laughs> Deason, yes, <laughs> Eddie Deason, huge Beatles fan. Did you, know, I was uh, you, can, uh, you can talk about the Beatles all day long with Eddie. Did you? Eddie, have in you? 41, Eddie Deason has an Eddie Deason puppet. It's going. That's, and, reason, and, and, that's one of the best scenes. That's one of the best he's segments. With, uh, Murray the Hamilton, the mayor from Jaws. Yes, yes. <laughs> When they're stuck on the Ferris wheel yeah. and they're looking for your own planes. Just, I, I'm just, just, I'm not going to go into it here, but like, uh, just do yourself a favor and Google Eddie Deason, Plato's Retreat, and see who he went there with. And, you know, just, I, we're moving on now, but, but you know, never just, going just look to it up. Google that. <laughs> In fact, I am going to put a safe search on my computer. <laughs> and yes, Thank Queen you, of Ed. Outer Space was the Shadow Douglas Gabor movie, I think. Absolutely. Ed. Thank yes. you, Ed. Uh, good stuff, man. All right, uh, good stuff. Uh, moving on. Um, hey, uh, well, again, uh, I mentioned, and again, it was a canon film, uh, Violent Bre the Violent Breed, and uh, here's a different uh, com composition of that uh, shot. But love Woody Strode, of course. Uh, there's Silva, and it's uh, it's a uh, obviously a World War II combat movie. Um, interesting stuff. But then we go to Chuck Norris and Code of Silence, mm. and uh, and once again, much like. Uh, much like Ghost Dog, uh, Silva is a mob uh, enforcer, yep. that or mob mob leader and stuff, and uh, it's a great role. It really, Once I mean, he, and, you know, and that one was actually the, shot in Chicago, by the way. He aged out of the assassin roles, and he got to be a, a mob a mob elder. Yeah, mob yes, elder. yeah. 
but and that's but occasionally where he stayed for the rest of his life. Well, but occasionally he would still be an assassin. Of course, he was in uh, oh, Warren yeah. Beatty's Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy? Yeah, and yes. he Here's played. The, and it's funny because I said Ghost Dog is where I first his his um face stuck out to me. Mm -hmm. But sure. I did see Dick Tracy in theaters, and it was a big. It was I didn't find out till later that that film was not considered a huge hit because for kids my age that film was huge and right so was well, all the merchandise the, the only reason it wasn't considered a big hit is because it didn't make any money right but, uh the, but a lot of people saw it <laughs> yeah. I, mean, seven bucks it ended up seeing it. I you yeah. know and like and it is and yeah it is one of those movies that i think of as as being unsuccessful just because it was a point when i like was becoming aware of box office stuff and all that before it sure over, that kind of nonsense took over the world but uh, but I, and I saw the movie in the theater. I you know I don't think it was perfect, but I and still don't. But it has a lot of it's. There's so much good crazy stuff about. Oh, absolutely. It. Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, I mean, again, he played influence, and I did not remember this character, but apparently, his first appearance <laughs> back in uh, 1946. And here's a great group shot of some of the villains, including Madonna, of course, and. I think Pacino as Big Boy Caprice was hilarious in the movie. Yeah, it's, one, uh, it's certainly one of his subtler late performances. Yes, hoo ha! <laughs> <laughs> the, the, yeah, but actually, it is a different muscle than Scent of a Woman and Hoo Ha and Devil's Advocate and all that stuff. Barely, and I mean, you know, barely, like it's I, kind I'm, of the same thing. I am I'm not, not trying to kid that. In, I'm saying it's better in Dick Tracy than it is in those. Yeah, movies. it's fun. I mean, that's it, the it thing. Fits the tone of Dick Tracy better. Yeah, this was coming off the heels of of uh, Keaton and and uh, and Tim Burton's Batman in '89. Yes, and it absolutely was still trying to play comedy parody rather than straight up action. And you could do you could do a straight up great Dick Tracy story if you wanted to. Uh, also, ironically, you know Warren Beatty has tied the rights to Dick Tracy, uh, making it impossible for anyone to make a a reboot. Of he made it that run. great special, uh, guys. You haven't looked up Leonard Malton or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that the, that the, special he made with Leonard Malton yeah, yeah. to hold on to the rights for another twenty five years. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. true, but uh, it has a lot of interesting cameos in it. Dick Van Dyke is very funny in the movie for his yeah. brief moment. Uh, I I like the movie. I, I, I like think though that it's one of those things that we, at the time was thought of as oh this is a campier thing, but like when you look at Tim Burton Tim Burton Batman next to Dick Tracy, like yeah. from this perspective. Tim Burton Batman, you know, I think that they're a lot closer than than people agree. Oh, absolutely. The time. There's a lot 100%. of campiness in Tim Burton Batman, and there's a lot of interesting stuff in Dick Tracy. Well, and I don't know if you can get these or not still, but uh, much like the old uh, Universal Monster Masks, here was a an opportunity. Again, they tried to merchandise the hell out of this movie. Oh, I had the example. watch. I had the action figures. There you go. Oh, what I these was are, by the way, these are rubber masks though that you could be all these people, including influence. There he is at the mm -hmm. bottom. Yeah, right. You know, so yeah, pretty crazy. If, if anyone still has those masks, I would say uh, do not wear them. You will probably get toxic shock. Uh, <laughs> that's not is that from personal yeah. experience. Did you act? No, out? I'm not a doctor. I'm just saying <laughs> probably best. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then again, uh, as we mentioned, think of this guy's career. John Frankenheimer, um, yeah. all these great, you know, Bud Bedecker, all the way again to Jim Jarmusch and then and, and Ghost Dog. My God, the, the the great directors that he had the opportunity to work with. Um, really fucking amazing. And, and what you should say, um, I said, so, I, so with Ghost Dog, I said his face made an impression. Little did I realize, and we were speaking about Batman, that I had heard Henry yes. Silva because he plays Bane. In Batman the Animated Series, you are yeah. uh, God. I'm so glad you grabbed That's that because right. I forgot right. to grab a, a, a Bane uh, image. He but you're right; he's so good. He's in the one episode in the uh, early series uh, playing Bane. It's very much the Luchador. Uh, yes, Bane. and then he's in a very famous episode of the show later in its run called Over the Edge, uh, which he's uh, absolutely great in, and it's fantastic. And um, it's it was first of all it was a huge deal for 90s kids like myself that bane was in the show because that was a character who had just come on the scene and we were like yeah. oh my god they're bringing in bane uh and yeah. he is great and he does the uh, great spanish accent to uh uh to really bring it because that, that before the tom hardy version bane was from south america and so mm -hmm. uh it was uh he is so cool on that show 
Uh, and again, uh, his career intertwining with Michael and Sara, because Michael and Sara, of course, was Mr. Freeze. Indeed. Yeah. Yep. No, that's a, again, I've, I've had the pleasure of talking to Andrea Romano, who yeah. did the voice casting and directing for that show. Brilliant. Yeah. And, and she, she always got incredible people to, mm -hmm. to be on the show. And I have to say, mentioning Bane uh, and Tom Hardy, uh, I just uh, yesterday had Pat Schumacher on, uh, who is the showrunner for um, the Harley Quinn show. Mm -hmm. And we did a we did a season three uh, um, look at the entire season, and I love uh, Bane on the Harley Quinn uh, cartoon. It's very very funny, yeah, and and uh, yeah. great 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 stuff. And and uh, they got hey man, it with all the chaos that's happening with uh, DC and Warner's and Discovery and everything, uh, they got greenlit for season four. Oh, that's cool. which is which cool. is pretty amazing. Is it a show so, with superheroes in it? The, Sometimes I, you're that's, never gonna that's, watch. It. That's why I won't. Oh, yeah, you're never gonna watch it. Okay. Diedrich Bader uh, is very is it funny. In, is it in color? Because I'm not gonna it, watch that. It is right. in color. Yes, yes, exactly. I mean, <laughs> any show can be in black and white if you just change the settings. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, like, I still can't oh, figure yeah. out how to do with my camera. Unfortunately, yeah, I can go to my shittier camera and be a little more washed out. That's as close, and that's one of the reasons why I'm the disembodied head. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> You're like Jombie in uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse. It's oh, true. Yeah. Quite a bit like that. I was thinking uh, I was more like uh, Orson Welles in his uh, horror anthology show that he used to do in the 70s, and he was always smoking the cigar and stuff. Mm -hmm. But what are you going to do? Uh, well, there you go, everybody. Uh, I think a very good look and a very thorough look at the great career of uh, the wonderful Henry Silva, uh, who we lost last week. Uh, his body of work is incredible, and yeah. it's fun. I mean, the and bottom not, line is, yeah, fun. and not a lot of actors around anymore who, you know, who had that scope of a career and went yeah. from, you know, from from the actor studio in the 50s through Broadway up through, you know, uh, through uh, junky Italian crime movies and Jim Jarmusch. Yeah, it, it's All just true. it's one of those careers that's fun to follow um, because he touches so many different eras. Yes. The fact that we can talk about uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents to him working with, you know, Jim Jarmusch and Paul Dini to Jim yeah. Jarmusch. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, yeah and Paul Dini. Yeah, yeah. You, you see, you see, um, uh, just uh, the different the different ways his talents could be uh, used. Couldn't agree more. Well, cool. everybody, thanks a lot. Um, you know, we're gonna pop in uh, every month or so, maybe, or you know, depending on schedules. Depending maybe on not. who dies next. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's the, the the Death Watch podcast, right? <laughs> No, no, no. My point was that instead, we just like we did Pelham one, two, three last time, that uh, we might find ourselves uh, talking about another film that maybe has slipped off the radar generationally. That yeah. we would like to remind people, hey, this is great, and this is why. And truly, I, I, my vote goes to a Manchurian Candidate, perhaps. Yeah, is, or or the or the the Frankenheimer Ouve. You know, the, uh, that, the uh, I would the, love the, to do that. The the Franken yeah. cast. The Franken or we could truly Franken cast <laughs> Franken cast Heimer. Or we could also do uh, the tall T, frankly. Honestly, we've talked too much about the tall T. I think we just need to move on. You now. don't want, uh, <laughs> let me pitch this, Bud Potiker. <laughs> Bud Bedeker. I would. Bud Potiker. Bud Potiker. Bud, Bud, Bud Potiker. I, I, I would love to do a I Bud Bedeker. I would Bedeker. love to do that. I think that that would be great. I would, so, I would, I'd be on board for an entire fucking podcast about the Bud Bedeker film. <laughs> yes, here's the thing. The audience for a Bud Bedeker podcast Look, is the three of us. Ian, yes, Ian, Ian, this is the Cheers. thing. I, the entirety of my, uh, of my podcasting uh, idea is you start with something no one wants, no one's that interested in. And then you find things that fewer and fewer people are interested in. No one is serving that market. If not us. That's true. And it's, it's true. And again, that is the great, uh, and listen, the internet, deservedly takes a lot of shit for all the crap that's out there. The great thing is if you're into giant squids, you will find dozens of websites. If you're into anything you will find and for better or for worse. So why not? That's why I love that we did out of limits. That's why yeah. we did Kinescope. Uh, yeah. And that's for why all, we're doing this. For, for all the bad things that, uh, that uh, Newton Minow said about the internet, calling it a vast wasteland. Uh, it, <laughs> Sorry, Go still on. with us, by the way. No, you're right. 68. <laughs> I'm well aware, uh, living in my hometown of Wilmette, Illinois. Yeah, no, all right. And, well, and, and it was just was just uh, featured right. on uh, our least favorite uh, news network, 
but I did watch that segment and they did him justice. So that was okay. Good. Well, when he dies, we'll do a podcast about him. God forbid. In his <laughs> 90s, much like Henry Silva. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for watching, everybody. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. Uh, more great stuff from uh, Word Balloon coming up this week. Uh, mystery novelists uh, Alex Segura and Rob Hart are going to join me talking about Alex one of their brand great. new comic books. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jam DiMatteis is going to join me on Thursday. Oh, Full legend. week, man. Great. So, yeah. So uh, that and more coming up on Word Balloon. Thanks a lot for watching, everybody. Take care. Mm -hmm.